All right. Last time I started talking about linearizability, and I want to finish up this time. Um, and the reason why we're talking about it again is that it's uh, our kind of uh, standard definition for what strong consistency means um, in storage style systems. So for example, lab three is a, um, needs to obey, your lab three needs to um, be linearizable. Um, and sometimes this will come up because we're talking about a strongly consistent system and we're wondering whether a particular behavior is acceptable. Um, and other times, linearizability will become, come up because we'll be talking about a system that isn't linearizable and we'll be wondering, you know, uh, in what ways might it fall short or deviate from linearizability. Um, so one thing you need to be able to do is look at a particular sequence of operations, a particular execution um, of some system that executes reads and writes, like your lab three, and be able to answer the question, oh, was that, was that sequence of operations I just saw linearizable or not? Um, so we're gonna continue practicing that a little bit now, plus um, uh, I'll try to actually establish some interesting facts that'll be helpful for us about what it means, about the consequences for the systems we build and look at of, um, of linearizability. Um, it's defined on particular operation history, so always the thing we're talking about is, oh, we observed you know, a, a sequence of requests by clients and then they got some responses at different times and they asked for different, different you know, to read different uh, data and got various answers back. You know, is that history that we saw linearizable? Okay, so um, here's an example of a history that might or might not be linearizable. So let's suppose at some point in time, some client, and so time's gonna move to the right, this vertical bar marks the time at which a client sent a request. Um, I'm gonna use this notation to mean that uh, the request is a write and asks to set um, variable or key or whatever um, x to value zero. So we got a sort of a key and a value. This would correspond to a put of key x and value zero in lab three. Um, and then, um, so, so this is sort of, we're watching what the client sent. The client sent this request to our service, and um, at some point the service responded and said, yes, your write is completed. So we're assuming the service is of a nature that it actually tells you when the write completes. Otherwise, uh, the definition isn't very useful. Okay, so we have this request by somebody to write. Um, and then I'm imagining in this example, there's um, another request that because I'm putting this mark here, this means the second request started after um, the first request finished. And, and you know, the reason why that's important is because of this rule that a linearizable history must match real time. And what that really means is that requests that are known in real time to have started after some other request finished, um, the second request has to occur after the first request in whatever order we work out that's the proof that the history was linearizable. Okay, so in this example, I'm imagining there's another request that asks to write x to have value one. Um, and then a concurrent request, maybe started a little bit later, asks to set x to two. Right, so now we have two, maybe two different clients issued requests at about the same time to set x to two different values. So, of course, we're wondering which one is gonna be the real value. Um, and then we also have some reads. If all you have is writes, um, well, uh, if all you have is writes, it's, it's hard to say too much about linearizable, linearizability because you don't know, you don't have any proof that the system actually did anything or revealed any values. Um, so we really need reads. So let's imagine we have some read and let's say we see in, our, in the history that um, a client sent a read at this time and a, the second time it got an answer for it, it read uh, key X and got value two. So presumably it actually saw this value. Um, and then there was another request by maybe the same client or a different client but known to have started in time after this request finished. Um, and this read of X got value one. And so the question in front of us is, is this history linearizable? And there's sort of two strategies we can take. Um, we can either cook up a sequence, because if we can come up 
with a total order of these five operations that obeys real time and in which each read sees the value written by the pre most recently preceding write in the order. If we can come up with that order, then that's a proof the history is linearizable. Another strategy is to observe that these um, rules, um, each one may imply certain this comes before that um, edges in a graph. And if we can find a cycle in the this operation must come before that operation, if we can find a cycle in that graph, then that's proof that the history isn't linearizable. Um, and for small histories, we may actually be able to enumerate every single order and use that to show this uh, history isn't linearizable. Anyway, any, any, any thoughts about whether this might be or might not be linearizable? Yes. Yes, okay. So the observation is that um, it's a little bit troubling that um, we saw a read with value two and then a read with value one. And maybe that contradicts, um, you know, there were two writes, one with value one and one with value two. So, th so we certainly, if we had a read with value three, that would obviously be something had gone terribly wrong. But, you know, but we got, there were a write of one and two and a read of one and two. So the question is whether this order of reads could possibly be reconciled um, with the way these two writes show up in the history. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm, uh, the game we're playing is that we have a, like maybe two clients or three clients and they're talking to some service, you know, maybe a raft lab three or something. And what we are seeing is requests and responses, right? So what this means is that we saw a request from a client to write X to the, you know, put request for X and one, and we saw the response here. So what we know is that somewhere during this interval of time, presumably the service actually internally changed the value of x to one. And what this means is that somewhere in this interval of time, the service presumably changed its internal idea of the value of x to two, somewhere in this time. But, you know, it's just somewhere in this time. It doesn't mean it happened here or here. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Yes, okay, so the observation is it is linearizable and it's been um, accompanied by an, an actual proof of the linearizability, namely a demonstration of the order that shows that it is linearizable. And the order um, is, so it's, yes, it's linearizable, and the order is first, right of x with value zero, um, and um, the server got both of these rights at roughly the same time. It's, it's allowed to choose the order itself, right? So let's just say um, it could have executed the right of x to value two first. Um, and then um, the read of x then executed the read of x, which would, the first read of x, which at that point would um, yield two. And then we're gonna say the next operation it executed was the right of x to one. And then um, the last operation in the history is the read of x to one. And so this is proof that the history is linearizable. Because here's an order. Um, it's a total order of the operations, and this is the order. Um, it matches real time. So um, what that means is, well, I'll just go through it. The, the right of x to zero comes first, and that's, that's totally intuitive since it actually finished before any other operation started. Um, the right of x to one comes, sorry, the uh, right of x to two comes second. So we're gonna say maybe that, um, th um, gonna mark here that sort of real time at which we imagine these operations happen to demonstrate that the order here does match real time. So we'll say, I'll just write a big x here to mark the time when we imagine this operation happened. All right, so that's the second operation. 
Um, then we're imagining that the next operation is the read of x of 2. Um, we, you know, it, there's no real-time problem because the read of x of 2 actually was issued concurrently with the write of x of 2. You know, it's not like the, write of x of, the read of x of 2 finished and only then did the write of x, of, write of x with 2 start. They really are concurrent. We'll just imagine that, that that sort of point in time at which this operation happened is right there. So this is the, you know, we don't care when this one happened. Let's just say there's the first operation, second, third. Um, now we have a, a write of x of 1. Let's just say it happens here in real time. It just has to happen after um, the operations that occur before it in the order, so that we'll say there's the fourth operation. And now we have the read of x of 1. It can pretty much happen at any time, but let's say it happens here. Okay, so this is the demonstration. So we have the order. This is the demonstration that the um, order is consistent with real time. That is, we can pick a time for each of the operations that's within its start and end time that would cause the, this total order to, to match our real time order. And so the final question is, did each read see the value written by the most closely preceding write of the same variable. And so um, there's two reads. This read is preceded by a write with the correct value, so that's good. And this read is preceded by a write, most closely preceded by a write of the same value also. OK, so this, this is a demonstration that this history was linearizable. And, and you know, the, and, you know Depends on what you thought when you first saw the history, but um, it's not always immediately clear that a setup this complicated is, you know, it, it's, it's easy to be tricked uh, um, when looking at these histories because you think, oh, the right of x of 1 started first, so we just sort of assume that the first value written must be 1, but that's actually not required here. Um, any questions about this? If the, you mean if these two were moved like this? The, okay, so if, 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 the, if the write with value 2 was only issued by the client after the read of x with value 2 returned, um, that wouldn't be linearizable because in whatever order, you know, any order we come up with has to obey the real time ordering. So any order we come up with would have had to have the read of x with 2 precede the write of x with 2. And since there's no other write of x of 2 in sight here, that means that a read at this point could only see 0 or 1, because those are the only other two writes that could possibly come before this read. So moving, you know, shifting these that much makes the, would make the example not linearizable. Yes. Uh, I'm saying that the first vertical line is the moment the client sends the request, and the second vertical line is the moment the client receives the request. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a very client-centric kind of definition. It says, you know, clients should see the following behavior. And what happens after you send a request in? Maybe there's a lot of replicas, maybe a complicated network, who knows what. It's almost none of our business. We're only, the definition is only about what clients see. Um, there's some gray areas, which we'll all come to in a moment, like if the client should need to retransmit a request, um, then we also have to, you know, that's something we have to think about. Um, other questions? Okay, so this one is linearizable. Um, Here's another example. Uh, I'm actually going to start out with it being um, almost identical. I'm going to start out with it being identical to the first example. So again, we have a write of x with 0. Um, we have these two concurrent writes. And we have the same two reads. So, so far identical to the previous example. So therefore, we know this must be, this alone must be linearizable. But I'm going to add, uh, let's, let's imagine that client 1 
issued these two requests. The definition doesn't really care about clients, but for her own sanity, we'll assume client one read X and saw two, and then later read X and saw one, but that's okay so far. Um, let's say there's another client, and the other client um, does a read of X, and it sees a one, um, and then the other client does a second read of X, and it sees two. And so the question is, is this linearizable? And we either have to come up with an order um, or um, uh, this comes before that graph that has a cycle in it. So, um, you know, the, the, the thing this is getting at, the puzzle is, if one client saw, there's only two rights here, so they, you know, in any order, one of the rights comes first or the other right comes first. Um, and intuitively, client one observed that the right with value two came first and then the right of value one, right? Th th these two reads mean that has to be the case that in any legal order, the right of two has to come before the right of one in order for the client one to have seen this, right? And it's the same order we saw over here. But symmetrically, client one's experience clearly shows the opposite, right? Sorry, ah. client two. <laughs> client two's experience shows the opposite. Client two saw the right of one first and then the right with value two. And one of the rules here is that there's just one total order of operations. We're not allowed to have different clients see different histories or different, um, different progressions, evolutions of the values that are stored in the system. There can only be one total of order that all clients have to experience operations that are consistent with the one order. And um, if one, this one client clearly implies that the order is right two and then right one, and so we should not be able to have any other client that, who observes proof that the order was anything else, which is what we have here. Um, and so that's a bit of an um, intuitive uh, explanation for what's going wrong here. And, and by the way, the reason why this could come up in the systems that we build and look at is that we're building replicated systems, either you know, raft replicas or maybe systems with caching in them. But we're building systems that have many copies of the data. And so there may be many servers with copies of X in them possibly with different values at different times, right? If they haven't gotten the commit yet or something, some replicas may have one value, some may have the other. But in spite of that, if our system is linearizable or strongly consistent, it must behave as if there was only one copy of the data and one linear sequence of operations applied to the data. And that's why this is an interesting example, because this could come up in a sort of buggy system that had two copies of the data and one copy executed these writes in one order, and the other replica executed the writes in the other order, then we could see this. And linearizability says, no, we can't see that. We're not allowed to see that in the correct system. So the, the cycle in the graph, in the, this comes before that graph, um, that would be a sort of slightly more proofy proof that this is not linearizable, is um, that r the right of two has to come before client one's read of two. So there's one arrow like this. So this right has to come before that read. Um, client one's uh, read has to come before the right of x with value one. Otherwise, um, this read wouldn't be able to see one. Right? If, if this, you can imagine this right might happen very early in the order, but in that case, um, this read of x wouldn't see one, it would see two, since we know this guy saw two. So um, the read of x with two must come before uh, the write of x with one. The write of x of one must come before any read of x with value one, because including client two's read of x with value one. Um, but in order to get value one here and for this read to see two, the write of x with value two must come between, in, in the order, uh, between these two operations. So we know that the read of x1 must come before uh, the write of x2. And that's a cycle. 
right? So there's no, um, there's no linear order that, but there's no linear order that can obey all of these um, time and value rules. And there isn't because there's a cycle in the, um, in the graph. That's a good question. This, this definition is a definition about histories, not about necessarily systems. So what it's not saying is that a system design is linearizable if something about the design. Um, it's really only history by history. So if, if we don't get to know how the system operates internally, and the only thing we know is we get to watch it while it executes, then before we've seen anything, we just don't know. Right, we maybe assume it's linearizable. And then we see more and more sequences of operations and say, gosh, they're all consistent with linearizability. They all follow these rules. So, you know, we believe it's probably the system linearizable. And if we ever see one that isn't, then we realize it's not linearizable. So this is, um, yeah, it's not a definition on the system design. It's a definition on what, the, what we observe the system to do. So in that sense, it's maybe a little bit unsatisfying if you're trying to design something, right? There's not a recipe for how you would design a, you know, ex except in the trivial sense that if you had a single server, you know, very simple systems, one server, one copy of the data, not threaded or multi-core or anything, it's a little bit hard to build a system that violates this in, in a very simple setup, but super easy to violate it um, in, in any kind of distributed system. Okay, so the lesson from this um, is that there's only, can only be one order in which um, the system is observed to execute the rights. All clients have to see values consistent with um, the system executing the rights in the same order. Um, here's a very simple history, another example. Um, supposing we write X with value one, and then definitely subsequently in time, maybe with another client, uh, another client launches a write of X with value two and sees a response back from the server saying, yes, I did the write. And then a third client does a read of X and gets value one. Um, so this is a very easy example. It's clearly not linearizable because the time rule means that the only possible order is the write of X with one, the write of X with two, the read of X with one. So that has to be the order. And that order clearly violates, the, since only one order, that order clearly violates the second rule about values. That is, you know, the most value written by the most recent write in the own one order that's possible is not one, it's two. So this is clearly not linearizable. Um, and the reason I'm bringing it up is because th this is the argument that a linearizable system, a strongly consistent system, cannot serve up stale data. Right? And you know, the, the reason why this might come up is, again, you have, maybe you have lots of replicas each, you know, maybe haven't seen all the rights or all the committed rights or something. So um, maybe there's some, maybe all the replicas have seen this right, but only some replicas have seen this right. And so if you ask a replica that's lagging behind a little bit, it's still gonna have value one for X. But nevertheless, clients should never be able to see this old value in a linearizable system. Right, there's no stale data allowed, no stale reads. Yeah, um, I have a question about the matching in real time. So, uh, like two operations will match real time, or like you can't switch their order around if one ends, one begins after the other ends. Yes. Right? But if there's some uh, overlapping of the interval, that's when we have freedom to switch the order. Yeah, if there's overlap in the interval, then there's, then, you know, the, you could, the system could legally execute either of them in a real time in the interval. And so that's a sense in which they could, um, the system could execute them in either order. Now, you know, other, you know, if it weren't for these two reads, the system would have, you know, to total freedom to execute the rights in either order. But because we saw the two reads, um, we know that, uh, you know, the only legal order is two and then one.
Yeah. So if the two reads were overlapping, then on then any order, then the reads could have seen either. In, in fact, I mean, until we saw the two and the one result from the reads, these two reads could have, you know, the system, until it committed to the values for the read, it still had freedom to return them in either order. Yes. So uh, does linearizability imply strong consistency? Um, I'm using them as synonyms. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, uh, for most people, although possibly not today's paper, um, linearizability is, is well defined and, and the, the people's definitions rarely deviate very much from this. Um, uh, strong consistency, though, is less, I think there's less sort of consensus about exactly what the definition might be if you meant strong consistency. It's often meant, to, it's usually meant to, in, in ways that are quite close to this, like, for example, that Oh, the system behaves the same way that a system with only one copy of the data would behave, right? Which is quite close to what we're getting at with this definition. But yeah, for you know, it's reasonable to assume that strong strong consistency is the same as serializable. Okay, so this is um, not linearizable, and the you know the the lesson is reads um, are not allowed to return stale data. Only, only fresh data. We can only return the uh, results of the most recently completed write. Okay, and I have a final, um, a final um, little example. So we have two clients, one of them submits a write to x with value three and then a write to x with value four. And we have another client. Um, and you know, at this point in time, uh, the client issues a read of x. Um, but, and this is a question you asked, the, it, the client doesn't get a response. Right, you know, who knows, like in, in the sort of actual implementation, maybe the leader crashed at some point. Maybe the, this client who sent in the read request, so oh, the leader maybe didn't get it because the request was dropped, or maybe the leader got the request and executed it, but the response, the network dropped the response, or maybe the leader got it and started to process it, but then crashed before it finished processing it, or maybe it did process it and crashed before sending the response. Who knows? From the client's point of view, you know, I sent a request and never got a response. So in the interior machinery of the client, for most of the systems we're talking about, the client is going to resend the request, um, maybe to a different leader, maybe the same leader, who knows what. So it sends the first request, request here, um, and maybe it sends the second request at this point in time. It times out, you know, no response, um, sends a second request at this point, and then finally gets a response. It turns out that, um, and, and you're going to implement this in lab three, that um, a reasonable way of servers dealing with repeated requests is for the servers to keep tables um, sort of indexed by some kind of unique request number or something from the clients in which the servers remember, oh, I already saw that request and executed it, and this was the response that I sent back. Because you don't want to execute a request twice. You know, if it's a, for example, if it's a write request, you don't want to execute requests twice. So the, Servers have to be able to filter out duplicate requests, um, and they have to be able to return the reply to repeat the reply that they originally sent to that request, which perhaps was dropped by the network. So the servers remember the original reply and repeat it um, in response to the resend. And if you do that, which you will in lab three, then um, if, you know, since the server, the leader could have seen value three when it executed the original read request from client two. It could return value three to the repeated request that was sent at this time and completed at this time. And so we have to make a call on whether that is legal, right? You could argue that, oh gosh, you know, the client resent the request here. This was after the write of x to four completed. So geez, we really should return four at this point instead of three. Um, and this is like a little bit a question of, it's like a little bit up to the designer, but 
if what you view is going on is that the retransmissions are a low level um, concern that's you know, part of the RPC machinery or hidden in some library or something, and that from the client application's point of view, all that happened was that it sent a request at this time and got a response at this time, and that's all that happened from the client's point of view, then a value of three is totally legal here because this request took a long time, it is completely concurrent with the right, not ordered in real time with the right, and therefore either the three um, or the four is, is valid, you know, as if the read request that really executed here in real time or, or here in real time. So the larger lesson is if you have um, client retransmissions, the, um, from the application point of view, if you're defining linearizability from the application's point of view, um, to, even with retransmissions, the real time extent of the of a request like this is from the very first transmission of the request to the final time at which the application actually got the response, maybe after many resends. Um, yes? You might rather you got fresh data than stale data. You know, if I'm, you know, supposing the request is what time it is, what time is it? You know, it's a time server, I send a request saying, oh, what time is it? And it sends me a response. You know, yeah, if I send a request now and I don't get the response until two minutes from now due to some network issue, it may be that the application would like prefer to see, when it gets a response, it would prefer to see a time that was close to the time at which it actually got the response, rather than a time deep in the past when it originally sent the request. Now, the fact is that if you, you know, if you're using a system like this, you have to write applications that are tolerant of, of these rules. If you're using a linearizable system, like these are the rules, and so you must write, you know, correct applications must be tolerant of, you know, if they send a request and they get a response a while later, they just, you know, you can't are not allowed to write the application as if, oh gosh, if I get a response, that means that the value at the time I got the response was equal to three. That is not okay for applications to think. You know, now what that, how that plays out for a given application depends on what the application is doing. <laughs> the reason I bring this up is because it's a common question in 6824. Six, you guys will implement the machinery by which servers detect duplicates and resend um, the previous answer that the server originally sent. And the question will come up, is it okay if you originally saw the request here to return at this point in time the response that you would have sent back here if the network hadn't dropped it? And then it's, it's handy to have a kind of way of reasoning. I mean, one reason to have definitions like linearizability is to be able to reason about questions like that. Right, and using, you know, using this scheme, we can say, well, it actually is okay by those rules. All right, that's all I wanted to say about linearizability. Have any, any lingering questions? You know, maybe I'm um, taking liberties here, but the, um, what's going on is that in real time, we have a read of two and a read of one. And the read of one really came after in real time the read of two, and so must, come, must be in this order, in the final order. That means there must have been a write of two somewhere in here. Sorry, a write with value one somewhere in here that is after the read of two, in the final order, right? After the read of two and before the read of one. In that order, there must be a write with value one. There's only one write with value one available. You know, if there were more than one, we maybe could play games, but there's only one available, so this write must slip in here in the final order, therefore, I felt um, able to draw this arrow. <laughs> um, and these arrows just capture the sort of one by one, the implication of the rules on what the order must look like. Yeah? Uh, would it be sufficient for the second example if we're thinking of the like, conflict graph approach to just look at 
RX2 and RX1, notice that they're both pointing to each other. Would that be sufficient to show that this is not linear? linear RX? Yeah, I mean, any or RX, so which, sorry, which, which? Yeah, so client one sees RX2 yeah. uh, before RX1, which means that RX2 his, his own RX1. He sees it before his own Rx1. Yes. Okay, so, so there'd be a... It must mean that there's an error that way. Yep. But because client 2 sees Rx1 before they see Rx2, there must be an error from Rx1 to Rx2. And well, we're not, we're, not, um, we're not really able to say which of these two reads came first. So we can't quite draw this arrow. If we mean this arrow to, to constrain the ultimate order, we're not, you know, the, these two reads could come in either order. So we're not allowed to say this one came before that one. Um, it could be there's a simpler cycle, actually, than I've drawn. So it may, it may be, because certainly the, the, the damage is in these four items. I agree with that. The, these two, these four items kind of are the main evidence that something is wrong. Now, whether a cycle, I'm not sure whether there's a cycle that just involves them. There could be. Okay, this is worth thinking about because, you know, if I can't think of anything better, I'll certainly ask you a question about linearizable histories on the midterm. Okay, so today's paper. Um, today's paper, Zookeeper. And, um, I mean, Part of the reason we're reading the Zookeeper paper is that it's a successful real-world system. It's an open source uh, you know, service that actually a lot of people run has been incorporated into a lot of real-world software. So there's a certain kind of reality and success to it. Um, but um, you know, that makes it attractive from the point of view of kind of uh, um, supporting the idea that the uh, Zookeeper's design might actually be a reasonable design. But the reason we're interested in it, in it I'm interested in it, is for um, two somewhat more precise technical um, points. So why are we looking at this paper? So one of them is that um, in contrast to Raft, like the Raft you've written and Raft as, as defined is really a library. You know, you can use a Raft library as you know, part of some larger replicated system, um, but Raft isn't like a standalone service or something that, that you can talk to. It's, uh, you really have to design your application to interact with the Raft library um, explicitly. So you might wonder, it's an interesting question, whether some useful system, sort of standalone general purpose system could be defined that would be helpful for people building separate distributed systems. Like is there serv some service that can bite off a significant portion of why it's painful to build distributed systems and sort of package it up in a standalone service that you know, anybody can use. Um, so this is really um, you know, the question of what would an API look like for um, a general purpose I'll call it, I'm not sure what the right name for things like Zookeeper is, but maybe I'll call it a general purpose um, coordination service. And the other question, the other interesting um, aspect of Zookeeper is that um, when we build replicated systems, and Zookeeper is a replicated system because among other things, it's, it's like a fault tolerant uh, general purpose coordination service. Um, and it gets fault tolerance, like most systems, by replication. That is, there's a bunch of, you know, maybe three or five or seven or who knows what Zookeeper servers. Um, it takes money to buy those servers, right? Like a, a seven server Zookeeper setup is seven times as expensive as a, as a sort of simple single server. So it's very tempting to ask, if you buy seven servers to run your replicated service, can you get seven times the performance out of your seven servers? Right? And you know, how could we possibly do that? Um, so um, the, the question is, you know, if we have n times as many servers, um, can that yield us n times the performance? So I'm going to talk about the second question first. Um, so from the point of view of this discussion about performance, um, 
I'm just gonna view Zookeeper as just some service, we don't really care what the service is, but replicated with a raft-like replication system. Zookeeper actually runs on top of this thing called Zab, um, which for our purposes, um, we'll just treat as being a, um, almost identical to, to Raft. And I'm just worried about the performance of the replication. I'm not really worried about what Zookeeper is specifically is up to. So the general picture is that you know, we have a bunch of clients, maybe hundreds, maybe hundreds of clients. Um, and we have, just as in the labs, um, we have a, a leader. The leader has a Zookeeper layer that clients talk to, and then under the Zookeeper layer is the Zab system that manages replication, and just like Raft, um, what Zab, a lot of what Zab is doing is maintaining a log um, that contains the sequence of operations that clients have sent in. Um, so really very similar to, to Raft. I may have a bunch of these, and each of them has a log that it's um, appending new requests to. That's a familiar setup. Um, so the client sends in a request and the Zab layer you know, sends a copy of that request to um, each of the replicas and the replicas append this to their in-memory log, probably persist it onto a disk so they can get it back if they crash and restart. Um, so the question is, as we add more servers, you know, we could have four servers or five or seven or whatever, does the system get faster as we add more, more CPUs, more horsepower to it? Do you think your labs will get faster as you have more replicas? Assuming that each replica is its own computer, right? So that you really do get more CPU cycles as you add more replicas. Yeah, you know, there's nothing about this that makes it faster as you add more servers, right? It's absolutely true. Like, as we add more servers, you know, the leader is almost certainly the bottleneck because the leader has to process every request and it sends a copy of every request to every other server. As you add more servers, it just adds more work to this bottleneck node, right? You're not getting any benefit, any performance benefit out of the added servers because they're not really doing anything. They're just all happily doing whatever the leader tells them to do. They're not you know, subtracting from the leader's work, and every single operation goes through the leader. So for here, um, you know, the performance is, you know, inversely proportional <laughs> to the number of servers that you add. You add more servers, this almost certainly gets slower because the leader just has more work. So in this system, we have the problem that more servers um, makes the system slower. That's too bad, you know, these servers cost a couple thousand bucks each. Uh, you would hope that you could use them to get better performance. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, um, what if the requests, maybe from different clients or successive requests from the same client or something, what if the requests apply to totally different parts of the state? So, you know, in a key value store, maybe one of them is a put on X and the other is a put on Y, like nothing to do with each other. Um, you know, can we take advantage of that? And you know, the answer to that is absolutely. <laughs> now, not in this framework, though, or, or it's the sense of which we can take advantage of it is very limited in this framework. Um, it could be, well, at a high level, the leader, the requests all still go through the leader. Um, and the leader still has to send it out to all the replicas, and the more replicas there are, the more messages the leader has to send. So at a high level, it, it's not likely to, the sort of commutative or, you know, commutative request is not likely to help this situation. It's a fantastic thought to keep in mind, though, because it will absolutely come up in other systems. And people, you, we will be able to take advantage of it in other systems. Um, okay, so, so this is a little bit disappointing. The extra server hardware wasn't helping performance. So um, a very uh, 
sort of obvious, um, maybe the simplest way that you might be able to harness these other servers is um, build a system in which, yeah, write requests all have to go through the leader. But in, in the real world, a huge number of workloads are read heavy. That is, you know, there's way more reads. Like when you look at web pages, you know, it's all about reading data to produce the web page. And generally, there are very relatively few writes. And that's true of a lot of systems. So maybe we'll send writes to the leader, but send reads just to one of the replicas. Right, just pick one of the replicas, and if you have a read-only request, like a get in lab three, just send it to one of the replicas and not to the leader. Now, if we do that, we haven't helped writes much, although we've gotten a lot of read workload off the leader, so maybe that helps. But we absolutely um, have made tremendous progress with reads, because now the more servers we add, um, the more clients we can support, right? Because we're just splitting the client read workload across the different replicas. So the question is, um, if we have clients send directly to the replicas, are we going to be happy? Yeah. Yeah, so up to date is the right, uh, is the right word. Um, in a raft-like system, which Zookeeper is, um, if a client sends a request um, to a random replica, you know, sure, the replica you know, has a copy of the log, and it, you know, it's been executing along with the leader, and, you know, for lab three, it's got this key value table, and, you know, you do a get for key X, and it's going to have some value for key X in its table, and it can reply to you. So, sort of functionally, the replica's got all the pieces it needs to respond to, client, to read requests from clients. Um, the difficulty is that there's no reason to believe that any one replica other than the leader is up to date because, um, well, there's a bunch of reasons why, why replicas may not be up to date. One of them is that they may not be in the majority that the leader was waiting for. If you think about what Raft is doing, the leader is only obliged to wait for responses to its append entries from a majority of the followers. And then it can commit the operation and go on to the next operation. So if this replica wasn't in the majority, it may never have seen a write. You know, maybe the network dropped it and never got it. And so, yeah, you know, the, the leader and, you know, a majority of the servers have seen the first three requests, but, uh, you know, this server only saw the first two. It's missing B, so a read of B, a read of, of you know, what should be there will just be totally, get a stale value from this one. Even if this replica actually saw this new log entry, it might be missing the commit command. You know, this Zookeeper Zav is much the same as Raft. It first sends out a log entry, and then when the leader gets a majority of positive replies, the leader sends out a notification saying, yeah, I'm going to committing that log entry. I may not have gotten the commit. And the sort of worst case version of this, although it's equivalent to what I already said, is that for all this client, for all client two knows, um, this replica may be partitioned from the leader, may just absolutely not be in contact with the leader at all. And you know, the follower doesn't really have a way of knowing that actually it's just been cut off a moment ago from the leader and just not getting anything. Um, so you know, without some further cleverness, um, if we want to build a linearizable system, we can't play this game of sending the attractive as it is for performance. We can't play this game of replicas sending read requests to the replicas. Um, and you shouldn't do it for lab three either, because lab three is also supposed to be linearizable. So any, any questions about why linearizability forbids us from having replicas serve the clients? OK, you know, the, the proof is the. Uh, maybe I lost it now, but the proof was that simple. Um, read, you know, write one, write two, read one. Example I put on the board earlier. You're not allowed to, you know, this is not allowed to serve stale data in a linear, linearizable system. Okay. Um, so how does, how does Zookeeper deal with this? Zookeeper actually does. You can tell from table two. You look in table two. Zookeeper's read performance goes up dramatically as you add more servers. So clearly, Zookeeper is playing some game here, which allows, must be allowing it to return read-only, to serve read-only requests from the additional servers, the replicas. 
So how does Zookeeper make this safe? The client's allowed to say they don't need the latest necessarily. That's right. I mean, in fact, it's almost not allowed to say it does need the written latest. The, uh, the way Zookeeper skins this cat is that it's not linearizable, right? They just like defined away this problem and say, well, we're, we're not going to be, we're not going to provide linearizable reads. And so, therefore, we don't, are not obliged, you know, Zookeeper's not obliged to provide fresh data to reads. It's allowed by its rules of consistency, which are not linearizable, to produce stale data for reads. Um, so it sort of solved this technical problem with a kind of definitional wave of the wand by saying, well, we never owed you that linearizability in the first place, so it's not a bug if we don't provide it. Um, and that's actually a pretty classic way to approach this, um, to approach the sort of tension between performance and strict and strong consistency is to just not provide strong consistency. Nevertheless, we have to keep in the back of our minds the question of um, if the system doesn't provide um, linearizability, is it still going to be useful? Right? You do a read and you just don't get the current answer, current correct answer, the most latest data. Like, why do we believe that that's going to produce a useful system? Um, and so let me talk about that. Um, so first of all, any questions about the, about the basic problem? Zookeeper really does allow client to send read-only requests to any replica. Um, and the replica responds out of its current state. And that replica may be lagging. Its log may not have the very latest log entries. And so it may return stale data, even though there's a more recent committed value. OK, so, um, so what are we left with? Well, uh, Zookeeper does actually have some, um, it does have a set of consistency guarantees. So. Um, to help people who write Zookeeper-based applications reason about what their applications, what's actually going to happen when they run them. Um, so, um, and these guarantees have to do with ordering, as indeed linearizability does. So Zookeeper does have um, two main guarantees that they state, and this is section 2.3. One of them is it says that um, writes, writes are linearizable. Now, you know, their notion of linearizable is um, not quite the same in mind, maybe, because uh, they're talking about writes, no reads. Um, what they really mean here is that uh, the system behaves as if, um, even though clients might submit writes concurrently, nevertheless, the system behaves as if it executes the writes one at a time in some order. Um, and indeed, obeys the real-time ordering of writes. So if one write is seen to have completed, uh, before another write is issued, then Zookeeper will indeed act as if it had executed the second write after the first write. Um, so it's writes, but not reads, are linearizable. Um, and uh, Zookeeper isn't a strict read-write system. There are actually writes that um, imply reads also. And for those sort of mixed writes, uh, those, those, you know, any, any operation that modifies the state is linearizable with respect to all other operations that uh, modify the state. The other guarantee it gives um, is that any given client, its operations execute in the order specified by the client. They call that FIFO client order. And what this means is that if a particular client issues a write and then a read and then a read and a write or whatever, that um, first of all, the writes from that sequence um, f fit in in the client specified order in the overall order of all clients' writes. So if a client says, do this write, then that write, then the third write, um, in the final order of writes, uh, we'll see the client's writes occur in the order of the client specified. So for writes, um, this is our client uh, specified order. And th this is particularly, you know, th th this is an issue with this system because clients are allowed to launch asynchronous write requests. That is, a client can fire off a whole sequence of writes to the leader 
to the zookeeper leader without waiting for any of them to complete. Um, and in order, presume, the paper doesn't exactly say this, but presumably in order for the leader to actually be able to execute the client's rights in the client specified order, we're imagining, I'm imagining, that the client actually stamps its right requests with numbers and say, you know, I'll do this one first, this one second, this one third. And the zookeeper leader obeys that ordering. Right, so this is particularly interesting due to these asynchronous write requests. Um, and for reads, this is a little more complicated. Um, the reads, as I said before, don't go through. The writes all go through the leader. Um, the reads just go to some replica, and so all they see is the stuff that happens to have made it to that replica's log. Um, the way we're supposed to think about um, FIFO client order for reads is that if the client issues a sequence of reads, again in some order, the client reads one thing and then another thing and then a third thing, that um, relative to the log on the replica it's talking to, um, the client's reads each have to occur at some particular point in the log, or they need to sort of observe the state as, it, as the state existed at a particular point in the log, and Furthermore, that the successive reads um, have to observe points that don't go backwards. That is, if a client issues one read and then another read, and the first read executes at this point in the log, the second read is you know, allowed to um, execute at the same or later point in the log, but not allowed to see a previous state. If I issue one read and then another read, the second read has to see a state that's at least as up to date as the first state. And so that's a significant um, fact in that we're going to harness when we're reasoning about uh, how to write correct zookeeper applications. And where this is especially exciting is that if the client is talking to one replica for a while and it issues some reads, suppose it's issued a read here and then a read there, if this replica fails and the client needs to start sending its read to another replica, that guarantee, this FIFO client order guarantee, still holds if the client switches to a new replica. And so that means that if you know, before a crash, the client did a read that sort of saw state as of this point in the log. Um, that means when the client switches to the new replica, if it issues another read, you know, it's, its previous read executed here. If the client issues another read, that read has to execute at this point or later, even though it switched replicas. Um, and, you know, the way this works is that each of these log entries is um, tagged, or the leader tags it with a ZXID which is basically just an entry number. Um, whenever a replica rep responds to a client read request, it, you know, it executed the request at a particular point, and the replica responds with the ZXID um, of the immediately preceding log entry back to the client. The client remembers, oh, this was the ZXID of the most recent data. You know, this is the highest ZXID I've ever seen. And when the client uh, sends a request to the same or a different replica, it accompanies the request with that highest ZX ID it's ever seen. And that tells this other replica, oh, aha, you know, I need to respond to that request with data that's um, at least relative to this point in the log. And that's interesting if this, you know, if this replica is not up, if this second replica is even less up to date, you know, suppose it hasn't received any of these, but it receives a request from a client, and the client says, oh, gosh, the last read I did executed at this spot in the log and some other replica. This replica needs to wait until it's gotten the entire log up to this point before it's allowed to respond to the client. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how that works, but either the replica just delays responding to the read, or maybe it rejects the read and says, look, I just don't have the information, talk to somebody else or talk to me later. Of course, eventually, the, you know, this replica will catch up if it's connected to the leader, and then you will be able to respond. Um, okay, so reads are ordered. Uh, they only go forward in time, or only go forward in the sort of log order. And a further thing which I believe is true about reads and writes is that um, reads and writes, the FIFO client order applies to all of a client's, all of a single client's requests. So if I do a write, if I'm a client, and I send a write to the leader, you know, it takes time before that write is sent out, committed, whatever. So I may send a write to the leader, the leader hasn't processed it or committed it yet, and then I send a read um, to a replica the read may have to stall you know, in order to guarantee FIFO client order. The read may have to stall until this client has actually seen and executed 
um, the previous, the client's previous write operation. So that's a consequence of this FIFO client order is that you know, reason writes are in the same order. And you know, the way you, the most obvious way to see this is if a client writes a particular piece of data, you know, sends a write to the leader, and then immediately does a read of the same piece of data and sends that read to a replica, boy, it better see its own written value, right? If I write something to have value 17, and then I do a read and it doesn't have value 17, then that's just bizarre. And it's evidence that, gosh, the system was not executing my requests in order. Because then it would have executed the write and then before the read. Um, so there must be some funny business with the replica stalling. The client must, when it sends a read and say, look, you know, I, the last re write request I sent to the leader was ZXID something. Um, and this replica has to wait till it sees that from the leader. Yes? Absolutely. So I think what you're observing is that a read from a replica may not see the latest data. So the, the, the leader may have sent out C to a majority of replicas and committed it, and the majority may have executed it. But if our replica that we're talking wasn't in that majority, maybe this replica doesn't have the latest data. And that just is the way Zookeeper works. Um, and so it does not guarantee that reads see the latest data. So if there, there is a guarantee about read-write ordering, but it's only per client. So if I send a write in and then I read that data, the system guarantees that my read observes my write. If you send a write in and then I read the data that you wrote, the system does not guarantee that I see your write. And that's, and, you know, that's like the foundation of how they get um, speed up for reads proportional to the number of replicas. I would say the system isn't linearizable. <laughs> and, and, but it, it's not that it has no properties. The, the writes are certainly linearized. All writes from all clients form some one at a time sequence. So that's a sense in which the writes, all writes are linearizable. And uh, each individual client's operations, maybe this means linearizable also. Um, it may, you know, this, this probably means that each individual client's operations are linearized, although I'm not quite sure. Yeah. They said when the client does a write, the leader gives it its CXID. And that's, I, that's how it guarantees um, the, You know, I, I'm actually not sure how it works. <laughs> but that's a reasonable supposition, that when I send in an asynchronous write, the system doesn't execute it yet, but it does reply to me saying, yeah, you know, I got your right, and here's the ZX ID that it will have if it's committed, right? just like start return. So that, that's a reasonable theory. I don't actually know how it does it. And then the client, um, if it does a read, needs to tell the replica, look, you know, last write I did was. I also, the ZX ID that it does return to the client, does it give it where the, the length of the log? Does it try to get I don't it know. the oldest one it can? Or the latest one, or oldest one, or just You mean, you mean a, when, if I do a read? Yes, if the client asks server for a read, it gets the ZID back. But is that ID like... It's of the data, it's of the operation. Back? Okay, so if you send a read to a replica, yeah. the replica's gonna return you, the, you know, really it's a read from this table is what you're, you know, notionally what the client thinks it's doing. So you, the client says, oh, I'm gonna read this row from this table. The server, this replica sends back its current value for that table. Um, plus the ZX ID of the last operation that updated that table. On that thing that it read. Yeah, so, the, so actually I'm, I'm, I'm not prepared to, so the, the, the two things that would make sense, and I think either of them would be okay, is um, the server could track the Z, for every table row the ZX ID of the last write operation that touched it, or it could just, to all read requests, return the ZX ID of the last committed operation in its log, regardless of whether that was the last operation to touch that row. Because all we need to do is make sure that client requests move forward in the order. And so we just need something that, to return something that's greater than or equal to the write that last touched the data that the client read.
All right, so these are the, the guarantees. Um, so, uh, you know, we still have the question of whether it's possible to do reasonable programming um, with this set of guarantees. And the answer is, well, this, you know, at a high level, this is not quite as good as linearizable. It's a little bit harder to reason about, and there's sort of more gotchas, like reads can return stale data, which can't happen in a linearizable system. Um, but it's nevertheless good enough to, to do, to make it pretty straightforward to reason about um, uh, a lot of things you might want to do with Zookeeper. Um, so, uh, there's a, so I'm going to try to construct an argument, maybe by example, of why this is not such a bad programming model. Um, one reason, by the way, is that there's an out. There's this operation called sync, which is essentially a write operation. Um, and if a client, you know, supposing I know that you recently wrote something, you being a different client, and I want to read what you wrote, so I actually want fresh data. Um, I can send in one of these sync operations, which is effectively, well, it, the sync operation makes its way through the system as if it were a write. Um, and you know, finally showing up in the logs of uh, the replicas, or really at least the replica that I'm talking to. And then I can come back and do a read, and you know, I, can, the, I can tell the replica basically, don't serve this read until you've seen my last sync. Um, and that actually falls out naturally from FIFO client order. If we, uh, if we count the sync as a write, then FIFO client order says reads are required to see state you know, that's at least as up to date as the last write from that client. And so if I send in a sync and then I do a read, um, I'm the, the system is obliged to give me data that's at least as up to date as where my sync fell in the log order. Anyway, if I need to read up to date data, send in a sync, then do a read, and the read is guaranteed to see um, data as of the time the sync was entered into the log, so reasonably fresh. Um, so that's one out, but it's an expensive one because you now have converted a cheap read um, into this sync operation which burned up time on the leader. Um, so it's a no-no if you don't have to. Um, but here's a couple of examples of scenarios that the um, paper talks about that the reasoning about them is simplified or reasonably simple given the rules that are here. So first I want to talk about the trick in section 2.3 with the ready file where we assume there's some master and the master is maintaining a configuration in Zookeeper which is a bunch of files in Zookeeper that describe you know, something about our distributed system like the IP addresses of all the workers or who the master is or something. Um, so we have a, a master who's updating this configuration and maybe a bunch of readers that need to read the current configuration and need to see it every time it changes. And so the question is, you know, can we construct something that even though updating the configure, even though the configuration is split across many files in Zookeeper, we can have the effect of an atomic update so that workers don't see, workers that look at the configuration don't see a sort of partially updated configuration, but only um, a completely updated configuration. <laughs> So that's a classic kind of thing that um, uh, this configuration management that Zookeeper, people use Zoo, Zookeeper for. So, you know, take, looking at the, sort of copying what section 2.3, how it describes this, um, we'll say the master is doing a bunch of writes to update the configuration, and here's the order that the, uh, the, the master for our distributed system does the writes. Um, first, we're assuming there's a ready file, a file named ready. And the, if the ready file exists, then the configuration is, we're allowed to read the configuration. If the ready file is missing, that means the configuration is being updated and we shouldn't look at it. So if the master is going to update the configuration file, the very first thing it does is delete um, the ready file. Um, then it writes the various files, you know, the various zookeeper files that um, hold the data for the configuration. Might be a lot of files, who knows. Um, and then when it's completely updated, all the files that make up the configuration, then uh, it creates again uh, this ready file. All right, so, so far, the semantics are actually extremely straightforward. This is just writes. There's only writes here, no reads. Writes are guaranteed to execute in uh, linear order. Um, and I guess now we have to appeal the FIFO client order. If the master sort of tags these as, oh, you know, I want my rights to occur in this order, then um, 
the leader is obliged to enter them into the replicated log in that order. And so the, you know, the replicas will all dutifully execute these one at a time. They'll all delete the ready file, then apply this write and that write, and then create the ready file again. So these are writes. The order is straightforward. Um, for the reads, though, it's, it's maybe a little bit, um, maybe a little more thinking is required. Supposing we have some worker that needs to read the current configuration. Um, we're going to assume that the, uh, this worker first checks to see whether the um, ready file exists. If it doesn't exist, it's going to you know, sleep and try again. So let's assume it does exist. So let's assume we assume that the worker uh, checks to see if the ready file exists after it's recreated. Um, and so you know, what, what this means now, these are all write requests sent to the leader. This is a read request um, that's just sent to whatever replica the client's talking to. Um, and then if it exists, you know, it's going to read F1 and read F2. The interesting thing that FIFO client order guarantees here is that um, if this returned true, that is, if the replica the client was talking to said, yes, that file exists, then you know, as we're, as that, what that means is that, um, at least with this setup, is that as that replica, um, that, that, that replica had actually seen the recreate of the ready file, right, in order for this exist to see um, to see that the ready file exists. And because successive read operations are required to march along only forwards in the log and never backwards, that means that you know, if the replica the client was talking to, it, if its log actually contained and it had executed this create of the ready file, that means that subsequent client reads must move only forward um, in the sequence of writes uh, you know, that the leader put into the log. So if we saw this ready, um, that means that the read occurs, that the replica executes the read down here somewhere after the write that created the ready. Um, and that means that the reads are guaranteed to observe the effects of these writes. So we do actually get some benefit here, some reasoning benefit from the fact that um, even though it's not fully linearizable, the writes are linearizable and the reads have to read sort of monotonically move forward in time through the log. And yes? Yeah, so that's a great question. So your question is, well, you know, all this client knows, you know, if this is the real scenario, that the create is entered in the log and then the read uh, arrives at the replica after that replica executed this create ready, then everything's straightforward. But there's other possibilities for how this stuff was interleaved. So let's look at a, a much more troubling scenario. Um, So the scenario you brought up, which I happen to be prepared to talk about, is that, yeah, you know, the, the master at some point executed a, a delete of ready. Um, or, you know, way back in time, uh, some previous master, this master, created the ready file, you know, after it finished updating the state. So the ready file existed for a while, then some new master, or this master needs to change the configuration, it deletes the ready file, you know, it does some writes, right? Um, and what's really troubling is that the client that needs to read this configuration might have called exists to see whether the ready file um, exists at this time, right? And you know, at this point in time, yeah, sure, the ready file exists. And then time passes, and the client issues the reads for the, um, you know, maybe the client reads uh, the first file that makes up the um, configuration, but maybe it, you know, and then it reads the second file, but maybe this file, this read, comes totally after the master has been changing the configuration. So now this reader has read this damaged mix of F1 from the old configuration and F2 from the new configuration. There's no reason to believe that that's going to contain anything other than broken information. So, um, so this first scenario was great. This scenario is a disaster. 
Um, and so now we're starting to get into questions of like serious challenges which a carefully designed API for coordination <clears throat> between machines in a distributed system might actually help us solve, right? Because like for lab three, you know, you're gonna build a put get system and a simple lab three style put get system, um, you know, it would run into this problem too and just does not have any tools to deal with it. But the Zookeeper API actually is uh, more clever than this and it can cope with it. And so what actually happens, um, the way you would actually use Zookeeper is that when the client sent in this exist request to ask, does this file exist? It would say not only does this file exist, but it would say, you know, tell me if it exists and set a watch on that file, which means if the file's ever deleted or if it doesn't exist, if it's ever created, um, but in this case, if it, if it is ever deleted, please send me a notification. Um, and furthermore, the notifications that Zookeeper sends, you know, it's a, the, the reader here is only talking to some replicas. This is all the replicas doing these things for it. The replica guarantees to send um, a notification for some change to this ready file at the correct point um, relative to the responses to the uh, client's reads. And so what that means, so it's, you know, because the, the, uh, the implication of that is that in this scenario in which you know, these, these writes sort of fit in here in real time, the guarantee is that if you ask for a watch on something and then you issue some reads, if that replica you're talking to executes something that should trigger the watch in, during your sequence of reads, then the replica guarantees to deliver the notification about the watch before it responds to any read that came, that you know, saw the log after the point of the op where the operation that triggered the watch notification executed. And so this is the log on the replica. And so, you know, if the, so the, you know, the FIFO client ordering rules say, you know, each client request must fit somewhere into the log. Apparently, these fit in here in the log. What we're worried about is that this read occurs here in the log, but we set up this watch, and the guarantee is that we'll receive the note if, if somebody deletes this file and we get notified, then that notification will, will appear at the client before a read that yields anything subsequently in the log. We'll get the notification before we get the results of any read that's, that saw something in the log after the operation that produced the notification. So what this means is that the delete ready is gonna, since we have a watch on the ready file, the delete ready is gonna generate a notification. Um, and that notification is guaranteed to be delivered before the read result of F2, if F2 was gonna see this second write. And that means that before the reading client has finished the sequence in which it looks at the configuration, it's guaranteed to see the watch notification um, before it sees the results of any write that happened after this delete that triggered the notification. Who, who generates the watches? Well, the replica, let's say the client is talking to this replica and it sends in the exists request. The exists request is a read-only request. It sends it to this replica. The replica is maintaining on the side a table of watches saying, oh, you know, such and such a client asked for a watch on this file. And furthermore, the watch was established at a particular ZX ID. That is, it did a read, that client did a read, we, the replica executed the read at this point in the log and returned results relative to this point in the log. And it remembers, oh, that watch is relative to that point in the log. And then if a delete comes in, you know, for every operation that the replica executes, it looks in its little table and says, aha, you know, the, uh, he, there was a watch on that file. You know, maybe it's indexed by hash of file name or something. Okay, so the question is, oh yeah, this, this replica has to have a watch table, you know? If the replica crashes and the client has to switch to a different replica, 
you know, what about the watch table, right? It's already established these watch. And the answer to that is that no, the uh, rep you switch, if your replica crashes, the new replica you switch to won't have the watch table. And, but the client gets a notification at the appropriate point in the, in the stream of responses it gets back saying, oops, your replica you were talking to crashed. And so the client then knows it has to completely reset up everything. And so tucked away in the, in the examples are missing event handlers that say, oh gosh, you know, we need to go back and reestablish everything if we get a notification that our replica crashed. All right, I'll continue this.